My dear brothers and sisters, welcome again for this wonderful day. Um, it's a very wonderful, great uh, week and it has been a very, very uh, a great day. And uh, uh, looking at the general conferences, uh, uh, there was a time where we, we were asking why is Elder, Elder Jeffrey Harholland because personally I missed him in, in, in that general talk. And um, uh, since I had actually missed him in the in the in the in the just recent uh, general conference, I I decided just to look one of his talks so that uh, I can be able actually to listen to some of the counsels that he gave sometimes back. And I came across this talk, which is very very interesting, and I would like just to share with you. He actually shared a lot of wonderful great things there. So, oh please, I will beg you to actually join with me in this talk and uh, uh, let's listen to this talk together. Prophet Joseph deepened our understanding of the power of speech when he taught it is by words that every being works when he works by faith. God said let there be light and there was light. Joshua spake and the great lights which God had created stood still. Elijah commanded, and the heavens were stayed for the space of three years and six months, so that it did not rain. All this was done by faith, said the prophet Joseph Smith. Faith then works by words, and with words its mightiest works have been and will be performed. Like all gifts which cometh from above, words are sacred and must be spoken with care and by constraint of the Spirit. It is with this realization of the power and sanctity of words that I wish to caution us, if caution is needed, regarding how we speak to each other and how we speak of ourselves. There is a line from the Apocrypha which puts the seriousness of this issue better than I can. It reads, The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh bones. With that stinging image in mind, I was particularly impressed to read in the book of James that there was a way I could be a perfect man. Said James, For in many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Continuing the image, imagery of the Bible, uh, I'm sorry, of the bridle, he writes, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also ships, which, though they be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm. Then James makes his point. The tongue is also a little member. But behold, how great a forest a little fire can burn. So is the tongue a fire among our members. It defileth the whole body. It is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, he says, these things ought not so to be. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Obviously, James doesn't mean our tongues are always iniquitous, nor that everything we say is full of deadly poison. But he clearly means that at least some things we say can be destructive, even venomous. 
And that is a chilling indictment for a Latter-day Saint. The voice that bears profound testimony, utters fervent prayer, and sings the hymns of Zion can be the same voice that berates and criticizes, embarrasses and demeans, inflicts pain, and destroys the spirit of oneself and of others in the process. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. James grieves, my brethren and sisters, these things ought not so to be. Is this something we could all work on just a little? Is this an area which we could each try to be a little more like a perfect man or woman? Husbands, you've been entrusted with the most sacred gift God can give you, a wife, a daughter of God, the mother of your children, who has voluntarily given herself to you for love and joyful companionship. Think of the kind things you said when you were courting. Think of the blessings you've given with hands placed lovingly upon her head. Think of yourself and of her as the God and Goddess you both inherently are. Then, reflect on other moments characterized by cold, caustic, unbridled words. Given the damage that can be done with our tongues, little wonder the Savior said, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. A husband who would never dream of striking his wife physically can break, if not her bones, then certainly her heart by the brutality of thoughtless or unkind speech. Physical abuse is uniformly and unequivocally condemned in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If it's possible to be more condemning than that, we speak even more vigorously against all forms of sexual abuse. Today, I speak against verbal and emotional abuse of anyone against anyone, but especially of husbands against wives. Brethren, these things ought not to be. In that same spirit, we speak to the sisters as well. For the sin of verbal abuse knows no gender. Wives, what of the unbridled tongue in your mouth? of the power for good or ill in your words. How is it that such a lovely voice, which by divine nature is so angelic, so close to the veil, so instinctively gentle and inherently kind, could ever, in a turn, be so shrill, so biting, so acrid and untamed? A woman's words can be more piercing than any dagger ever forged, and they can drive the people they love to retreat beyond a barrier more distant than anyone in the beginning of that exchange could ever have imagined. Sisters, there is no place in that magnificent spirit of yours for acerbic or abrasive expression of any kind including gossip, or backbiting, or catty remarks. Let it never be said of our ward, or our home, or our neighborhood, that the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, burning among our members. May I expand this counsel to make it a full family matter. We must be so careful in speaking to a child. What we say or don't say, how we say it and when, is so very, very important in shaping a child's view of himself or herself. But it's even more important in shaping that child's faith in us 
and their faith in God. Be constructive in your comments to a child always. Never tell them, even in whimsy, that they're fat or dumb or lazy or homely. You would never, ever do that maliciously. But they remember and may struggle for years to forget and to forgive. And try not to compare your children, even if you think you're skillful at it. You may say, most positively, that Susan is pretty and Sandra is bright, but all Susan will remember is she isn't bright and Sandra that she isn't pretty. Praise each child individually for what that child is and help him or her escape our culture's obsession with comparing competing and never feeling we are enough in all of this I suppose it goes without saying that negative speaking so often flows from negative thinking including negative thinking about ourselves we see our own faults we speak or at least think critically of ourselves and before long that's how we see everyone and everything no sunshine, no roses, no promise of hope or happiness. Before long, we and everybody around us are miserable. I love what Elder Orson F. Whitney once said. The spirit of the gospel is optimistic. It trusts in God and looks on the bright side of things. The opposite or pessimistic spirit drags men down and away from God looks on the dark side, murmurs, complains, and is slow to yield obedience. Perhaps we could honor the Savior's declaration to be of good cheer. Indeed, it seems to me we may be more guilty of breaking that commandment than almost any other. Speak hopefully. Speak encouragingly, including about yourself. Try not to complain and moan incessantly. As someone once said, even in the golden age of civilization, someone undoubtedly grumbled that everything looked too yellow. <laughs> I've often thought that Nephi's being bound with cords and beaten by rods must have been more tolerable to him than listening to Laman and Lemuel's constant murmuring. Surely, he must have said at least once, hit me one more time, I can still hear you. <laughs> Life has its problems, and there are negative things to face. But please accept one of Elder Holland's maxims for living. No misfortune is so bad that whining about it won't make it worse. <laughs> Paul put it candidly but very hopefully. He said to all of us, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good and edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Let all bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. In his deeply moving final testimony, Nephi calls us to follow the Son of God with full purpose of heart, promising that after ye have received the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, ye can speak with a new tongue, yea, even the tongue of angels, 
And how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, he says, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, they speak the words of Christ. Indeed, Christ was and is the Word, according to John the Beloved, full of grace and truth, full of mercy and compassion. So, brothers and sisters, in this long eternal quest to be more like our Savior, may we try to be perfect men and women in at least this one way now by offending not in word or more positively put by speaking with a new tongue the tongue of angels our words like our deeds should be filled with faith and hope and charity the three great Christian imperatives so desperately needed in the world today with such words spoken under the influence of the Spirit, tears can be dried, hearts can be healed, lives can be elevated, hope can return, confidence can prevail. I pray that my words, even on this challenging subject, will be encouraging to you, not discouraging that you can hear in my voice that I love you because I do. More importantly, please know that your Father in heaven loves you and so does his only begotten Son. When they speak to you, and they will, it will not be in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire but it will be with a voice still and small, a voice tender and kind. It will be with the tongue of angels. May we all rejoice in the thought that when we say edifying, encouraging things unto the least of these, our brethren and sisters and little ones, we say it unto God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. By Jeffrey Holland, uh, with that talk, I came across it because as I was thinking uh, that uh, uh, he's one of my favorite apostles and every time he speaks, he speaks of things that are real and, and, and the things that uh, we see them every day every day what exactly is happening in our social lives uh, and all that so i think that that was that was a, a very edifying talk and um, he spoke of like how we need to conduct ourselves uh, and especially we need to watch our tongues and relative to what uh, james the apostle in the bible actually warned and and and, and, and spoke and, and he saw he he he, he elaborated how uh, tongues have actually done a lot of destructive words and and and, uh, and, and as he was speaking i i put of uh, uh, the prophet's talk uh, president uh, nelson's talk when he spoke of that we should be peace peacemakers and uh, it's time for us to bury our verbal arsenals and and, and this is what uh, uh, jeffrey Hart holland also said that uh, the tongue our verbal uh, words can be very, very detrimental. They can be very, very destructive, and uh, and, and and that is uh, what uh, a great counsel uh, that I picked there. And he said that we should look the way we talk to our children too. That that one is very key. Okay, the way we speak to our children, we should not actually show them, uh, you know, uh, some of the things, or maybe talk to them in a way that it's very demeaning. Uh, we should look at the way we talk to the to our children it's very very key and even the way we also relate to uh, uh, each other's family members both the wife and the husband and, and 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 that is that is very key and i and i pray as we listen to this talk that we may also encourage one another to to be so kind to one another 
and the way we talk to one another and and and, and, and the way also we conduct ourselves to each other that would be very key for us to ensure that we have the spirit every now and then in our lives so the way we speak we can either use our tongues to curse or we can either use our tongues also to bless and that's why i liked the way he related it that tongues uh, uh, can be used okay somebody can use it to sing very nice songs or even speak very good things but at the same time also the same same tongue can be used to do a lot of negative things in our lives that can break hearts and 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 that is very key we should know that we have a very powerful uh, vessel in us and that vessel the lord expects us to use it in his own glory not to destroy other people and 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 to demean our own children and our own spouses in our families so otherwise uh, thank you very much for joining me today and uh, i'm really really happy to know that uh, you guys are following up with me and I, one thing i want to say that i really appreciate your support and please continue to subscribe and hit a thumbs up there and if you have any comment please i really want to know your comments about this talk kindly just drop your comments there so that i get to know what you feel about this talk uh, from elder jeffrey harholland otherwise thank you very much god bless you and see you next time